School days, so we're told, are supposed to be the happiest days of your life. Well, I'm not convinced. Are you? This story is called Jenny Green Teeth and it's by VR Salmon. Michael Windy Windling stood by the river's edge, his face pressed into the trunk of an alder tree, bitter tears soaking into its bark. The river was forbidden to any boys below the upper fifth, but every boy knew about the loose planks in the fencing at one corner of the games field, which could be lifted aside and squeezed through. And Michael had discovered a spot a little further upstream, where an ancient willow had toppled over, reaching right across to the opposite bank, making a sort of narrow bridge. A clump of alder grew in a tight circle, and by pushing one's way into the centre, a person could be rendered invisible to prying eyes. This was the spot to which Michael fled whenever school life became intolerable. The object of his latest distress was clutched damply in a hot fist. The remains of a letter from his mother, which seemed to Michael to bring down upon his thin shoulders the end of the whole world. Dearest Michael, it read, I am sorry to say that the Peaslake house will not be ready in time for the holidays, and your father still has business in Simla, so he thinks it best for us to remain in India until the autumn. It has been arranged for you to stay on at school, and your headmaster and his wife have kindly agreed to take care of you until the new term starts. I know you will be disappointed, but I want you to be a brave boy about it and behave for Mr. and Mrs. Henstridge, who are being put to considerable trouble. I understand that another boy from your class is also staying behind, so I am sure you are great friends already and will have a jolly time after all. Your father sends his best wishes. Fondest love, Mother. He had received the letter from his housemaster earlier that evening, after prep, and had slipped away to be by himself before the final evening bell summoned the boys to bed and the nightly terror of the dorm. Michael was small and slight, and one of the youngest in his class. He was also a nervy child, starting at the slightest sound, or dissolving into tears at the merest provocation. Thus it was universally agreed that Windy was a queer cove and deserved every mischance that came his way, courtesy of whatever could be dreamed up by the imaginations of eleven-year-old boys. He had acquired his unfortunate but inevitable nickname after one particularly shameful episode in biology class. Today, boys, I will demonstrate to you the inner workings of a frog. Mr. Baxter, the science master, had announced as he removed the top of a bell jar with a flourish. The class pushed forward and shoved around the bench excitedly to get a better view, and Michael had somehow found himself jostled to the front. Stumbling, he had put out his hand to regain his balance and almost knocked the petri dish in which lay the little corpse, pinned out, ready for dissection. The pathetic sight of the chloroformed frog had been too much for Michael's sensibilities, and he had let out a choking sob and fled from the room, howls of jeering laughter ringing in his ears, almost drowning out the enraged bellows of Mr. Baxter as he tried to regain control of his class. That night, as Michael climbed miserably into bed, his foot touched something cold and Throwing slimy. Throwing back the sheet, he saw with horror a disgusting mess of glistening entrails and mottled green skin. He screamed and screamed and carried on screaming until he had to be led away by matron and made to spend the rest of the night in the sanatorium. His humiliation was complete. No one owned up to the prank, but Michael was sure that Stanhope was behind it. Anthony Stanhope's older brother had been a fine athlete who had won many rowing cups for the school, and this fraternal prowess had conferred upon the younger Stanhope an unjustified popularity he was quick to exploit to its fullest extent. In short, Stanhope Minor was a bully whose chief delight was in tormenting others, and the most delightfully reliable victim of his vicious schemes was Michael Windling. Stanhope's parents were currently travelling in Europe and it was with an awful sinking sensation that Michael knew without a shadow of a doubt that Stanhope Minor, his arch tormentor, was to be his fellow inmate for the duration of the summer holidays. 
The contents of his mother's letter were now committed to memory, and contemplation of the full awfulness of their import prompted a renewed convulsion of sobs. As the fit subsided and his ragged breathing returned to normal, he began to be aware of the silence. It was a warm June evening, and only a moment before the air had been full of the sound of buzzing insects. Now even the birds had stopped singing, and it was as though the whole of nature was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. There was only the sound of the river splashing and gurgling in its progress towards the weir further upstream. Michael? Master Michael? Someone was calling his name, and yet he couldn't quite be sure if he had actually heard the words or somehow imagined them inside his head. The light had begun to shimmer oddly, rendering everything slightly out of focus. Michael? There it was again, a strange low voice that seemed to be everywhere and nowhere at once. Why do he take on so, my little man? Thy roaring's fair bamfer in my head. Michael blinked. Uh, hello? Where are you? I can't see anyone. This was met with a faintly unpleasant chuckle. Turning quickly, Michael tried to catch the direction of the sound, but it was impossible to tell. Fantastically, he had the notion that it was coming from the river itself. What do you want? I'll fetch someone if you don't go away. Another chuckle. Michael's head was beginning to throb and he felt very hot. He would like to lie down on the riverbank and feel the cool, damp moss against his forehead. Have a care, Master Michael. Tis my ground he be standing on. Old Jenny don't care for thy tone. Some proper respect be due to I. Now, nah, no matter. He be naught but a widden, and Jenny's heart be sore for thy troubles. I. I. Michael blinked again, and a slight breeze ruffled his hair. The leaves of the willow tree quivered. Why don't he tell I all thy sorrows, Master Michael? Jenny has power to help thee. The hypnotic, insidious voice snaked its way into Michael's mind, and he felt himself falling gently, infinitely. The voice was irresistible, and he found himself confessing his most intimate terrors and secret fears. All of a sudden, he could see with perfect clarity a solution to his problems and an end to his misery. He saw Stanhope floating face down in the river, his hair tangling with the pondweed, his pallid, lifeless fingers pulsating gently with the current. I wish that Anthony Stanhope was dead, he shouted, then instantly clapped his hands over his mouth. Why had he said that? What a terrible thing to think, let alone to say out loud. Something let out a triumphant cackle or was it just a flock of rooks that rose into the air at that same moment, filling the sky with their raucous cawing? Dimly in the distance, Michael heard the evening bell sound, and the spell was broken. He raced back towards the school, telling himself that he must have suffered a heat stroke or eaten something at dinner which disagreed with him. When he reached the dorm, to his surprise, nobody noticed him for once. The rest of the boys were crowded around Stanhope, and the reason quickly revealed itself. On Stanhope's bed lay a magnificent toy yacht. It was two feet long, and its varnished hull gleamed in the evening sunlight. It had solid brass rails and a miniature wheelhouse. It was a beauty. Stanhope was explaining to the enthralled group how the sails could be lifted and lowered by means of an ingenious pulley system. Michael recognised it. Every boy in the school would have seen it, since it had, until very recently, been the centrepiece in Brundle's toy shop window in town. My pa sent me a postal order for my birthday, Stanhope was explaining airily, and he told me to buy whatever I wanted, so... There was a chorus of, Gosh, Stanhope, she's a smasher, and I bet she sells a treat, by golly! Then, when are you going to take her out, and can we have a turn at sailing her? 
Stanhope stood smiling and regarded the eager faces. I'm going to take her out on the river tomorrow night. I've a fancy to see her sail by moonlight. I reckon she'll make a jolly fine sight and I bet she's got some speed on her. And since this will be her maiden voyage, so to speak, I'm going to take her out on my own. You can all have a turn later, but tomorrow evening is going to be an adventure and I want it all to myself. I'll tell you all about it when I get back. It's Midsummer's Eve tomorrow, so it won't get dark for ages. You chaps will have to keep a lookout for me and make sure old Follett doesn't get suspicious. There were groans of disappointment, but no one dared argue with him as he carefully placed the precious object on top of his locker. Then Michael had a terrible presentiment and burst out, Oh, but you can't! Not tomorrow night! Oh, please, Stanhope, not tomorrow! You mustn't go! Stanhope spun round, his eyes narrowing. Oh, and why can't I, little Windy? Michael, wilting under Stanhope's glare, flushed and muttered something about the river being out of bounds. You're not going to tell, are you, Windy? Because I don't like sneaks. And chaps who are sneaks gets what's coming to them. Are you a sneak, Windy? The other boys sniggered and began chanting, Sneak! Sneak! Windy's a sneak! I, I'm not, I promise. I won't tell. Only please, Stanhope, don't go to the river tomorrow. Michael begged, but he was drowned out by a fresh chorus of sneak. Until Mr. Follett, the housemaster, stuck his head around the door and threatened the whole dorm with detention if they didn't be quiet and get ready for bed. And be quick about it. Lights out in ten minutes. The following day promised to be splendidly hot. The sun rose in a cloudless sky and a mist was rising off the games field as the 6.30 bell sounded. When Stanhope swung his legs over the side of his bed, he encountered an unpleasant dampness and a slight odour that reminded him of stagnant ponds. Peering sleepily at the floor, he could see quite clearly a set of wet footprints on the grey linoleum that went all around the bed. What the? he exclaimed, standing now and frowning. Then he marched over to Michael's bed and shook him roughly by the shoulder. Oi, what's the meaning of this? And he dragged the smaller boy by his pyjama collar and pointed. Michael's eyes grew round as saucers. Honestly, Stanhope, I didn't do anything. I promise you I didn't, he gasped, unable to tear his eyes away from the now fading prints. Show me your feet, demanded Stanhope, and two other boys grabbed him and held him down while his feet were examined but they were found to be bone dry. I don't know how you did this, but I know it was you, hissed Stanhope. Honestly, Windy, you're a freak. You shall be in a loony bin. And he turned away contemptuously. No one mentioned that the footprints, although they were boy-sized, did not appear to be altogether human. They seemed to possess only three toes, which were curiously webbed. For the rest of the day, Michael did his best to keep out of Stanhope's way, while at the same time keeping a discreet watch on his movements. He told himself he was imagining things and that nothing was going to happen, especially to someone as corporeal and robustly healthy as Stanhope. By lunchtime, he had almost persuaded himself, but as the final evening bell sounded, his apprehension and sense of foreboding grew. He was hopelessly aware that whatever transpired tonight was completely outside of his control and yet also utterly and entirely somehow his responsibility. Feverishly he began to formulate a plan. If he were able to reach the dorm before anyone else he could fashion his pillows into the semblance of a body under the counterpane and then hide himself in the store cupboard on the landing and wait for Stanhope to emerge after lights out. Then he would follow at a safe distance, taking care not to be seen. After that point, his imagination failed him and he would just have to improvise. A little after ten, he heard a soft click and then a creak as Stanhope emerged from the dorm, clutching his beautiful yacht. He waited a few more minutes to allow Stanhope to descend the stairs and quietly unlock the front door. Feeling his way along the passage, Michael silently slipped after him. He could see the figure of Stanhope scurrying across the games field, helpfully illumined by the light of a full moon, and heading towards the gap in the fence that led to the river. He maintained a safe distance, crouching low. 
Pushing through at the same spot, he could see the other boy a little distance ahead of him. He was able to maintain a steady pace for some several yards until disaster struck. He stumbled over a tree root and inadvertently let out an audible gasp. Stanhope's head snapped around in the direction of the sound. Who's there? he hissed, then windling, you bloody little sneak. I knew it was you. He advanced on the prone form of Michael, fury blazing in his eyes. You just don't give up, do you? This time you'll really get what's coming to you. And he kicked out savagely. Placing the yacht on the ground, he launched himself at Michael in a whirl of fists and feet. Michael rolled this way and that, trying to dodge the blows. Suddenly, there was a loud splash. In their frenzy, they had somehow managed to knock the toy yacht into the water, and she was now floating at pace into the centre of the river. The current was strong, and she began to pick up speed. The moonlight glinted off her sails as she made stately progress towards the weir. Horrified, both boys stood frozen for a few seconds. Then Stanhope let out an enraged howl and began to run towards the river's edge. Michael caught hold of his jacket. No, don't! Come away! Just leave it, he implored. Stanhope turned, consumed with rage and hatred. You did this! You did it on purpose, he raged. You're nothing but a jealous little crybaby and a sneak. I'm going to kill you. And do you know what? No one will care, not even your parents. They'll be glad you're dead. You're disgusting, do you know that? No one wants you. You're a disgusting little freak. And he seized Michael around the throat and began to squeeze. Michael was no match for Stanhope and batted feebly at the fingers which were closing ever more tightly around his windpipe. Stanhope's face was white with fury and his lips were drawn back over his teeth in a snarl. Flecks of spittle flew from the corners of his mouth. Michael's lungs felt as if they were on fire and little pinpricks of light danced before his eyes. He could feel himself slipping into unconsciousness. Then suddenly there was a whooshing sound and he was able to breathe again. He stood, dazed, gulping lungfuls of air, and looked around for Stanhope, who was struggling to get up from the ground. Evidently, the fight had driven them almost to the river's edge, where the ground was slippery with mud, and Stanhope must have lost his balance. Woozily, Michael tried to take a step backward, but his limbs wouldn't obey him, and there was a loud buzzing in his head, as if a swarm of bees were trapped there. With a roar, Stanhope came at him again. He put out his hand to ward off the anticipated blow, but somehow the open palm became a fist and connected with Stanhope's nose. There was an audible crack, and Stanhope doubled over in pain. Before he could recover, Michael lowered his head and barreled into him, raining blow after blow on the other boy and driving him closer to the river. He was a whirling demon, moving by pure instinct, and Stanhope was too astonished to retaliate. There was a splash, and Stanhope tumbled backwards into the water. Michael was on his knees now, panting with exertion. He opened his mouth, and words tumbled out. Strange words in an ancient tongue he did not know. Guttural sounds that were barely words at all, but which seemed to possess a terrible power. It was as though the memory of all the pain and rage and terror of small defenceless things from time immemorial coalesced into an energy which flowed through Michael and distilled into an inhuman and unearthly scream. And something heard. As Stanhope struggled towards the bank, the river began to foam and boil. The water seemed to rise up around him, beating him back towards the centre. And in that water teemed hundreds of creatures with sharp teeth and claws that snapped and tore hungrily at his flesh, dragging him down below the surface. In vain he cried out, pleading for help, for Michael lay insensible in the mud. Neither boy was missed until the following morning, whereupon a search party was sent out. It was the gardener who discovered Michael, semi-conscious, shivering and raving, crouched on the river bank. He was carried to the sanatorium where he was revived with warm broth and brandy. Several attempts were made to question him about the previous night and Stanhope's whereabouts, but all he would say was that the river had eaten Stanhope, 
All further interrogation was useless, as Michael simply screwed his eyes shut and shook his head violently, refusing to say any more. A doctor was fetched, and he was given something to make him sleep. For a whole week he lay in a twilit world, half awake and half tormented by terrifying dreams in which clammy webbed fingers reached out to pull him down, down into a watery world of pondweed and slime. In the absence of any other explanation, it was generally believed that Stanhope, strictly against school regulations, had gone down to the river at night and somehow fallen in. Possibly he had hit his head on something. Michael had bravely tried to save him, but had been quite unequal to the task. Witnessing the drowning of his schoolfellow had temporarily unhinged his mind, and references to the river eating the unfortunate boy were clearly a whimsical, childish description of an event he could not bring himself to articulate fully. A cousin of his mother's was prevailed upon to take him away to stay with her until his parents could arrange passage back to England. He never returned to the school. A few weeks later, two fishermen spotted what they thought was a discarded pile of rags caught in weeds by the weir. On closer examination, it was revealed to be a body, but such was the state of it that it was only the remains of the school blazer and grey slacks that identified it as Stanhope. The flesh had been almost entirely stripped from the face and hands, as if something had been at it, as the men put it. Various theories were posited, including one about a giant pike that lived in the river that had already been responsible for snatching a small terrier pup and even a couple of swans. But old men, after a few pints in the local hostelry, would nod to each other and say quietly, I reckon old Jenny's at him. Michael never mentioned the events of that night again. As he grew up, he took care to avoid any activity which might take him near a river or any other inland body of water. Friends and family teased him good-naturedly about it, but he was adamant and nothing would persuade him to join them. For he knew, with complete certainty, that should he ever find himself at a spot where willow and alder meet, overhanging a mossy bank, she would be waiting for him. Every river, every sparkling brook or stagnant weed-choked pool was hers, and he could never again allow himself to hear that hypnotic, seductive voice calling him to claim a destiny he abhorred, to become the thing he most feared, himself. <laughs>